and the highly coveted role in the sunless and biopic Phantom Punk starring Ding Rames. A graduate from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Architecture, Sean has received 12 awards including the 2011 Scarborough Urban Hero Award and the 2012 Medal of Appreciation for his work as a motivational speaker from the United Nations Association of Canada. Currently the host and keynote speaker of LIFT, Sean was presented the 2013 Planet Africa Volunteer Award and the Black Canadian Role Model Award for his work with youth in Canada, the US and the UK. Through performing, lecturing and mentoring, Sean continues to cement his role as an active leader in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sean Morissette, a.k.a. Subliminal. Alright, how's everybody doing this afternoon? Good, good. I see there's like a flurry of people that left. Hopefully they come back. <laughs> Because I got some pretty important stuff I want to share with you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, a big round of applause for all the people who presented before me. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so there was a, a lady up here who was saying, you know, she was emphasizing that her work uh, was, was not, um, uh, what's the word, a uh, university led initiative, or it was a university initiative. What you're going to see here is a Sean Morissette initiative. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's not something that, you know, I, I've been funded by organizations and different things. I've worked with people, but it's something that, you know, I went to school to study architecture, and I never would have imagined um, that uh, I would have uh, ultimately been working with youth and creating curriculum. So my hope today is it's not so much uh, research-based, it's not stats-based. I'm that person when schools are like, okay, we need to explore leadership, we need music, and we need mathematics. What can you do? And I've been blessed enough to have a diverse enough background in a number of different fields to reach into each of these different toolkits and create something that's, that's sometimes what some folks in, in Toronto would consider groundbreaking. Um, my background, you know, I started beatboxing to impress this girl in recess. If you can see the screen, there's a, there's a girl uh, right there at the circle around her face. I was just trying to beatbox to impress her. Um, I didn't realize beatboxing would open up so many doors and help you build self-confidence, get on stage, tour, most deaf. I uh, do theater, um, let's see, we've got a musical production, uh, barbering, uh, and of course, uh, going to school to study architecture. Why am I sharing all this is not to boast and brag. This is actually a big component when I go to schools and I speak to a lot of our, our youth and our young men. It's showing you how doing something like beatboxing, you can extract skills. There's skills that are transferable from one aspect of your life to another that you might not even know exists. And my, my, my hope is to show you, based on my life skill set, that that's possible. Some of the images you're seeing here is actually my architectural thesis. Let me just go back a little bit. Uh, my architectural thesis at, at the University of Toronto, where I created a form of architecture based on hip hop, all right? Um, based on what you hear instead of what you see, which was, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so, I've been blessed enough, sorry, my, belief, my pointer is having a little difficulty reaching my laptop at the back. Maybe we can just advance, there you go. There we go. So, one thing I wanted to highlight, and, and this sounds pretty basic, but I know, you know we talk a lot about stats, and we talk a lot about really complex frameworks. I just want everyone to remember sometimes it's, it's, it's the power of exposure that you see. So this is simple things. Uh, you know, uh, more specifically, when we talk about the music that our, our young men are listening to nowadays, the trap music, for example. I mean, the name, the name is one thing, but a friend of mine was that uh, we consider him the godfather of Canadian hip hop, a gentleman named uh, Maestro Fresh West. Um, you know, he, he, he pointed out to me that a lot of his music is, is, is based on uh, musical notes that are, are played with, with minor keys. So uh, I started to think about a workshop where we could explore that, what, what that does uh, in terms of emotion and feel when you ingest all this all day, every day, how it makes you feel. We talk about black love on a Wednesday night. You're looking at that and you're wondering, what does that mean? My ex-girlfriend, all right? I was at her house on a Wednesday night and I saw her parents salsa dancing in the kitchen. That's it. That one thing that I saw, this, this, this black love, I was confused. It's Wednesday night, it's the middle of the week, you should be upset, leave me alone, they're in the kitchen, it's hot, it's sweaty, there's no AC, all right, but they're dancing. And I've never seen anything like that. So I'm just pointing out, as I go into my presentation, the power of exposure. And it's always my hope that when I stand in front of our youth in Toronto, Canada, I've also been blessed to work in Atlanta, the South Bronx, uh, all over the UK, which is where I met Dr. Majors. 
um, which is why I'm here today. <laughs> Big round of applause for Dr. Mason, by the way. Thank you so much. All right. All right. And um, I think that the, the ability to stand and break down with people's preconceived notions of what it means to be an architect, what it means to be a hip hop artist, what it means to be married, right? <laughs> you don't look like you're married. What's that, what, is, what, what am I supposed to look like when I'm married? Like, like floral ties and tight suits? I don't know. I don't know what that means. But um, anyway, so I like to break down these preconceived notions. Um, a couple of things. Let me see if I can get it. So, so I'm jumping ahead, pressing it too many times. Okay, so ah, it's, it's a slight delay. I apologize. So, working in the um, in, in Canada, the U.S. and the U.K. with with youth, there's certain observations that I've made. Some of them may seem very straightforward, but I, I still have to present them. Um, uh, a lot of our black males, amongst our black males, are looking for positive male interaction. Okay, uh, lack of male figures that are present. This was something that I, I saw on a whole other level when I did work in Atlanta. Um, I worked uh, in southwest Atlanta, Georgia, in a place called Shamrock Gardens, which is considered probably one of the, one of the roughest uh, uh, neighborhoods in Atlanta. Um, and uh, the connection that the youth had with me was something that I, I, I've never seen before um, in terms of just being around another male was positive. Um, little enthusiasm for school. Uh, I noticed that when I went to the UK, when I'm in the US, when I'm in Kansas, there's not too much enthusiasm. Emotional barriers, a standoff attitude. Um, interested in sports and hip hop, of course. Those are the two big, big things uh, most of our, our young males are interested in. Um, my goal was to show them that you know you could do that, but you could also have a plan A, B, C, and D, and transfer your skills and do other things as well. Uh, we can't all be hip hop artists. We can't all be ballers. Um, appreciative of the down to earth style of delivery, so they're very appreciative that I speak to them in a way that they understand, and it's not speaking at them, it's speaking with them. Uh, surprised, surprised by the diverse skill set. You know, um, that's something I saw in the U.S. a lot when I went there. Um, they, they're always shocked that, you know, wow, you, you did all this. I mean, you know, you, you edited that video, you, you know, you shot the video, you did architect. So it's not about boasting, but it's showing that, you know, you can, you can do multiple things, right? You can do multiple things. Sometimes we get stuck in a, you know, stay in your lane type of attitude. Um, and of course, uh, won over by the, uh, they're won over by the interactive and multimedia workshops, which uh, I'm going to show you some samples of the videos um, of some certain things. I got to let you know. There's quite a few videos, but they're not really longer than a minute in length. Um, so I think, but I, I felt the need to actually show you what the youth were doing as opposed to just talking about it. Um, so let's see if this will advance. Um, so the power of the multimedia, some of this is what I kind of described. Um, the key to success, I've been working with black males and youth since 1999. Um, much like the like, women came up and said, you know, I didn't plan to be a teacher. I didn't plan to be, you know, working with youth, but I was part of an organization where we speak at schools and a lot of youth gravitated towards what I was saying. I got asked a lot of questions and decided, you know, I'm going to do this. Um, but I quickly realized that the ability to speak and, and, and keep, uh, especially our young black males' attention for more than five minutes, <laughs> at least this is my experience in Toronto, it's a gift. Okay, it's a gift. So I'm going into schools and I'm speaking for over an hour. I have school administrators saying, saying, you know, I think maybe we should just give, you know, 20 minutes tops. I'm like, no, give me an hour. Okay, we'll give you an hour. Maybe we should only invite the grade fives because the six, seven, eights are too rowdy. I'm like, no, bring the whole school. And they have a look on their face like, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? Okay, but I, I think that, that, that it's, it's, it's the, the delivery style and so, so on and so forth. Very comical approach. I'm not afraid to laugh for myself. Uh, talking about the multiple paths I have and the ability to actually say that I've done these things and I've tried them. Not afraid to admit, you know, when I've failed and when I've, when I've succeeded. Um, jumping around a little bit. Um, and of course, using the arts to drive home important messages uh, and the ability uh, to actually explore each of those fields. All right? So this right here is a, is a sample. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm just going to play the first little clip. This is a video that I created in what is considered one of Toronto's uh, top, I guess, high-risk neighborhoods. It's an area in Scarborough, uh, Kingston, Galloway. All right? Um, and I had the youth explore, you know, through music. And they also could make the beat themselves and everything. Explore through music, you know, how they feel the media views them versus who they really are. And my hope is that by putting these, these, these videos up on YouTube, when people type in Kingston Galloway, this is one of the things that can, that can pop up to help combat some of what the media may say about these neighborhoods, all right? And this neighborhood in particular. So this is called Who I Really Am, and uh, I'll play just a little bit of it. Please take it in. Yeah. 
smart. When I grow up, I want to be a basketball player. I like math, play basketball, and go to school. I like to play basketball, and my favorite subject is math and geography. something called the International uh, Soul Music Summit. And um, uh, I mentioned to, uh, to, to, to one of the people there, I said, man, I'd love to come back and work with the youth. And there's a, a gentleman named Brent Sobel who said, okay. And I said, what do you mean okay? He said, okay, you're gonna come back and work with the youth. And just like that, he paid for my flight to go and uh, I messed up at the border and I said, I'm going to do volunteer work. And they said, work, what, work? And sent me right back to Toronto. And then they paid for my flight again to change the date and time and I came back again. And um, I did some work in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I know we're running a bit short on time, so I won't, I won't play uh, the whole thing, but I was just gonna see if we could have fast forwarded to one minute, 27 seconds on that, just to take in a little bit of, of what these young men had to say. Um, we can just keep going a little bit more. One minute, 27 seconds. That's 23 seconds. Let's move a little bit more to the right. And a little bit more to the right. A little bit more, a little bit more. We'll move about a minute, uh, about a minute more. Keep it moving. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, if we can get it to 127, one minute, 27 He's gonna get there. seconds, I think it's, maybe it's, maybe it's stuck, maybe it's stuck. There we go, we're moving ahead. Okay. Well, let me just play a little bit of it. <laughs> right there. Yes, So, so this is a little sample, but nobody's ever gone into the neighborhood and, and, and worked with them. And I'm showing you this because you're going to see as the examples proceed, they, they, they start to get a, a lot more intricate as to the rest of the request. But just giving the youth the voice to be able to talk about these things and talk about the neighborhoods in a positive way. Um, let's see if I can reach this. Okay, so. This is the reaction. So what did you guys think of the, of the workshop? Uh, yeah? What was your favorite part about the workshop? Yeah? You enjoyed that? Yeah. Did you enjoy what you were rapping about? How about the rest of you guys? Yeah, you What do you think? We we were like doing. Okay, what were you doing? Rap. And what were you rapping about? That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, my man 
Rodriguez. What did you like about the program, dude? Well, for the most part, I like the guy that did like, like, we came in just to play, like, what we created our own community. Like, we go get the first and we get together to make a song. And, and, and like, at the end, I like to get to each, to, like, to, like, triple, like, the remembrance of it. And I, like, told him that, like, Okay. All right. So, so if you notice what the little boy said, the first thing he said, "What were you rapping about, Shamrock?" And what about Shamrock? Hood. And what else? Uh, hood. And what else? School. And what about school? Passing the test. And so I'm putting that in there because the the innocence of a youth. They still have, they still have the ability to, you know. They, they, we're not born gangsters, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, 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 and so that track was called We Will Succeed. Um, and it, it actually went back another year and did another track with them as well. So just a little sample of that. Um, alternative learning continued. Really apologize about not being able to uh, get my, so maybe you could advance the slide to the next one, I'm sorry. So, and we'll press it one more time. So now it starts to get more complicated here in Toronto. The Toronto District School Board is uh, one of Toronto's, well, Canada's biggest school board. They have youth who are expelled, youth who are suspended, youth who are in the middle of transition, youth who are sort of lost, youth who are 17, 16, reading at a grade three, four, or five level. What do we do to help get them credits? And a gentleman named Devin Jones, um, reached out to me and basically said, Sean, what, what can you do? What, what can you do to, uh, uh, to work with these youth? And uh, you know, that's interactive. You want to explore three things. You want to explore uh, identity, you want to explore opportunity, and you want to explore uh, accountability. And I'm going to share with you this, this piece right now. This is actually done by a youth um, named Nick. Um, he explored the word opportunity using no words. He explored the word opportunity using sound. We created a, a one-minute soundscape of what the word opportunity sounded like to him. He's also a youth who, who never used to smile, <coughs> never smiled, never really spoke. And um, I'll let this uh, video speak for itself. All right? Let's see if we can if we get advanced to the next one. And one more time, please. Okay. Can you um, tell me? How you felt about this workshop, this sound art workshop? No, I felt pretty good about it because I never experienced something like this. I never made a piece like this. My idea came from like just three sketches, and you know, anything could happen. And because, because sketch yeah. idea. So, and and what was your what was your piece about from those sketches? What is what is your piece about? My piece was about it's about bad and good opportunities. There could be bad opportunities and there could be good. We still could take them, you know? And that's what's going to lead you. That's the whole thing. That's what this is about. I noticed that the sound piece has knocking in it. Can you explain what the significance or the symbolism is of the knocking? Uh, every time you open a door, it's an opportunity to, like, to a certain thing in life. And what's on and, and in your piece, what's on the other side of the door? Violence, um, education, it's good and bad. How did you end the piece? So, I ended the piece with um, paper, paper says this. What's the symbolism of that?
So that's but one piece of opportunities. Another student did one on accountability, another one did one on identity. And at the end of the piece, we hear him start to flip through the papers faster. So what's the metaphor? You're flipping through the papers faster. It's because when I opened up the doors and I saw what I saw, it encouraged me to want to go to school and get my education and learn more. And so what I'm talking about is alternative learning. I'm talking about using a different side of the brain, using a different side of the mind, inferencing, abstraction, um, uh, metaphorical thinking, and uh, huge success. So each of the students that I work with in this program were each able to earn two high school credits by the time I was done working with them within the program. Um, so this is, I won't, play, I won't play too much of this, but this is a, a youth who's exploring identity uh, through dance, okay? So you did a uh, contemporary dance. What did you do today? What, what, what was it you did? So what I did today was I basically showed them how to do identity by being a tree at first, because, you know, by being a tree at first, you have to start from the root. Well, you're talking about being a tree, but you were doing what? Drawing a tree? I was um, acting like a tree. Dancing, okay. Dancing and acting like a tree, like I was growing from the roots. And then I did my slow motion dance, and then I had different face emotions, showing my emotions, showing my, um, you know, my um, happiness, my emotions, and so on, you know? And knowing yourself is a really good thing, you know? So once you have that, nobody can take your education, or once you know yourself, nobody can take that from you either. So that's all I want to say, you know? I'm blessed to be here, but... So we're going to have a shame, no? I'm proud of the family. It's a little bit of this piece. So after doing this, he also went on to apply to various dance schools. And um, just one sample of how expression can come in multiple forms. Uh, I'll skip this one. Um, drawing, this one was a sketch that one of the youth had created. Um, and basically, after creating that sketch, uh, looking at identity, he actually drew a sketch of his own face with, with, a, with a, a slave's muzzle over his mouth. And in the hair, he, the outline of his hair he put, but he fought on a daily basis. Um, and there was a bullet hole in, 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 the, in the side of the head. And we said, well, what is that? He said, that's a void in my mind that nobody can fill. And when we looked, talked a little bit more about what he was drawing, that bullet hole was caused by the absence of his father. Mm -hmm. And when I presented this work back to his teacher, they discovered that, that they believed that he may have been, uh, been sexually abused as a child. And we're able to then take action to begin to help him, okay? Uh, a little bit about the stats here in Toronto. Um, so this uh, demographics of the 2006-2011 grade nine cohort, uh, from my understanding, people had to really push to get this information out, all right? So there were 1,718 uh, black students who were, who were surveyed of the 1,718, 64.5% graduated, 12%, 12.7% uh, still the TDSB, dropped out 22.8. Um, but what I really want to show you is, if I can find a sweet spot, there it is. No, not that one. Let's go back. One. the point is killing me. <laughs> Let's try it one time. Okay. Um, so we have, um, Confirmed university in Ontario, 24.2%. Confirmed college in Ontario, 17.2%. Applied to post-secondary in Ontario, but records of but no records of acceptance, 11.4. Did not apply to post-secondary, 47.3%. This one is uh, the percentage uh, highly at risk with six or fewer credits. You can see that the, the dark brown is the black, black students. Six or fewer credits accumulated by grade nine, uh, by the grade nine, um, 26 percent. All right, 26 percent of the black youth. So the highest number there. And there's a reason I'm showing you all this. 
uh, seven, seven or more credits earned after grade nine, seven or more. So you see the black students, 74% at the bottom. Uh, and this last one, um, this last one, secondary school uh, self-graduation leadership skill set. So the leadership skill sets, you see the black male, or the black students, I should say, at 65%. So we, we know that, that, that our, our, our youth can be leaders, right? Most definitely, we know they can be leaders. But it's hard to say that. Okay, but I'm showing you these stats to understand that I don't know what it's like in the States, how easily you can get this information, but we have to fight to get this information from the TDSB to understand this, all right? So this brings in the final piece of what I want to talk about, where it all led, led, led me to, is this LEARN project. There's a gentleman named Tony Jean Baptiste who couldn't be here today. Uh, he is a graduate of Boston University, he's initially from uh, Dominica, I believe. Um, and he did a thesis at Boston University looking at um, various academic barriers that are holding black, uh, holding back youth. He understands that you know you can give youth tutors, you can give them you know all, all the you know the, the extra extra sessions after after class to help them graduate. But if they're not doing the work, we need to look at that. So he he looked at maybe five basic academic indicators um, of this. Let me just go back, sir. Go back, go back, go back, go back. There we go. So the five indicators was uh, student-teacher relationship. How are the students relating to the teachers? Something called school comfortability. How comfortable do the students feel at school? Uh, something called cultural congruence. The culture of self, the culture of who you are relative to the culture of your school and how you feel you fit in. Perceived threats of racism and discrimination. There's an understanding that even if you are uh, maybe not being discriminated against, but you think you are being discriminated against, the psychological effects of it is the same as if you were being discriminated. And of course, academic barriers, literal academic barriers within the classroom. So where does Sean come in? He basically said, I need you to create um, you know, some multimedia activities that you can do with the youth to help them explore uh, without even realizing that they're kind of exploring it, looking at these things, and hopefully we can, we can help the youth. And so I'm just going to show you a couple uh, from that. The one, first one being um, student-teacher relationship. Uh, basically what we did was we had the youth identify um, how, what they felt they were falling behind in, in, in class, in school. And Make a change. It could be a small thing. Make a change and do it for one week. Do it for a solid week. And then come back in and sit down with me in the camera and talk about if you noticed, uh, did you notice that your teachers maybe gave you some positive reinforcement? Did your peers notice? Did your parents notice? And how did it feel with you on the inside? And some of the things that we noticed were, were, were absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. We'll take a look at this. Turn the volume up, please. So, is this where you want to be? Right here? No, don't take a picture. I'm not taking a picture. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, um, state your name and your school. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, and I go to Walter Perry Junior Public School. What grade you in? Five. Five. Cool. So, there was something that you wanted to try to improve my public was um, I wanted to try and improve on uh, like getting less distracted in class. Okay. And um, so did you, did you try it? How did it go? It actually went pretty well. Really? Okay. So tell me, what was it? What was it that you did exactly? Um, so my you're... friends were trying to talk to me, but mostly I tried to talk to them, so I stopped that. And when my friends tried to talk to me, I um. I just kind of, sometimes I tell them to just like stop, and sometimes I just ignore them. Okay, and how did it make you feel? It made me feel bad because like, someone's trying to talk to me, and like, my parents taught me to like, when someone's trying to talk to you, look at them and like, listen. Mm -hmm. So, it kind of made me feel bad, but then, when I like got more focused on my work and got time to do it, it was like it was actually pretty kind of better. Cool. Did your friends notice? Yeah, because usually they're like we always make jokes and all that stuff like that. Yeah, but but this time they. They're like, huh? He's not responding. 
And what about your teacher? Did you teach you all this? My teacher, like, she, my teacher actually tells me, like, you need to get more focused and work. And when she's seen that, she actually got cool. She actually got happy. So she, so she told you, so she told you that you, you, you should get more focused. But did she notice that one time when you got more focused? Yeah, she noticed a lot. How do you know she noticed? Because she always like looked up and smiled, and she was like giving me thumbs up and everything. And at the end of the day, she walked up and she, she talked to me in the hall, and she was like, "Nice job, Lizzie. You really improved." And she gave me a high five. And how did that make you feel? Made me feel happy, but it still made me feel sad because I didn't want my friends. Okay. Um, last question. Um, would you do it again? Would you try it again? Yeah, I'd try it again. But I, but before I try it, I'd probably give my friends a heads up before I try it, so they're not just like, is he mad at me now? <laughs> Yo, I'm so proud of you, man. I'm really, really proud of you. Uh, <laughs> so, and there's lo there's loads of videos like that. Obviously, I'm not going to show them all, but I'm just showing you how to make those small, those small shifts. Uh, we had a lot of youth that were, were saying, well, "I'm always anxious when I get to school and I keep getting in trouble. Why is that? Well, I keep showing up 17 minutes late. Why are you showing up 17 minutes late? Because I don't set my alarm. So set your alarm and see what happens. And what happens when you show up 10 minutes early? and document how it makes you feel. And those small shifts in people's day-to-day -day activities uh, resulted in some, some, some significant changes, all right? Uh, cultural congruency, um, this is essentially looking at the culture of yourself. So I had the youth uh, create, um, I had the youth create a, a, a collage. So they did a silhouette of themselves and they filled themselves with images that describe who they are. And then I had them do the exact same thing uh, for their for the school, okay. Oops, I jumped ahead. So, okay. So, if you look closely, it's actually the outline of a, of a school, and they put you know the images that that are most prevalent to them, make it as large as possible. This young man that we know is nicknamed Skeet. Right? He's got a school. Six cruel hours of our lives. All right, bored. And then he put these images of, uh, of students in the bathroom. So what is that about? He said, well, there's, there's some, some students who go in there and they eat their lunch and they sell food and stuff in the bathroom. And we explained to him, well, do you like that? No. Well, who are you telling about that? Nobody. Well, maybe you talk to your principal. Maybe you talk. And it was amazing how many youth actually felt they didn't have a voice, that they, they couldn't do these basic things like go to the office and talk about these things. So just looking at, 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 at the culture and, and, and understanding how maybe they feel they fit in or they don't fit into their school. Um, Robert. This one right here, let me just pull this back Staff. real quick. I gotta pull this back, I gotta pull this one back. This is probably, uh, this is probably one of the last videos I'll show. Um, so, school comfortability. How a student feels comfortable within their school. What can you do for this subliminal? What can you do for this, Sean? So what I did was I said, okay, we're gonna take, reach into the architectural background. You're gonna draw a floor plan, a floor plan of your school. All right, not detailed, just rough. You're gonna do a bubble diagram. You're gonna take a red marker and a, and, a, and a green marker. You're gonna highlight the spaces that feel good and feel bad to you, all right? Then I'm gonna give you a drum machine, a hip hop drum machine that producers use to make beats. I'm gonna put the sound of a heartbeat on the drum machine. And the spaces that feel uh, negative to you, you're gonna hit the drum pad really, really fast because you're anxious. The spaces where you feel good, you're gonna hit the drum pad nice and slow. And what I found was absolutely amazing. The youth were actually jumping over themselves just because they wanted to, to use a drum machine. What they didn't realize they were doing was actually creating a, 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 a map of how they would navigate their school. What would we do with that map once we had it? We would share it with the parents and share it with the school. So a piece of this, of these five academic indicators we're looking at is not just to for the changing of, of, of the student is to give back to the school. So you can understand, you have people selling food in the bathroom of your school. Do you, are you aware of this, <laughs> right? And it's impeding, you know, how other, other students may want to access that space. So I put the drum machine, I put the heartbeat, and this is a sample of what, of what happened.
time this one girl when got to her locker she started to hit it really, really fast and we said why are you why are you hitting the heartbeat so fast around your locker she said because you know the boys make they make cat calls and they whisper and this we feel uncomfortable and it was really cool to see the same boys who were doing it were in in our session and we were able to have that dialogue and stop that right away okay so I think what's fascinating is that youth could use their voice without it even having to use their voice all right um, so I, there was more stuff. I kind of condensed the presentation just slightly due to time. But essentially, the takeaway is that learning happens on multiple levels, all right? Um, the ultimate goal is to continue with some of this and then maybe begin to track this a little bit more data-wise, research-wise, stats-wise. But what I can tell you is by sort of blowing out some of these traditional frameworks and relating to youth in, 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 uh, with multimedia and on different levels, I feel there's been some, some, some huge gains and huge success in getting youth who otherwise might be disengaged and remain quiet in class to actually use their voice. And by making these slight, slight, slight shifts, uh, working towards changing the actual trajectory that many of our black males may be on. Sean Morissette, thank you very much for taking the time and taking the time.